so my topic obviously is the area of public participation. And what I'm going to try and do is really give a, a fairly high level analysis because we have very relatively limited time on the continued influence of EU law and public participation in Ireland. I'm going to really consider um, two cases which I think are of particular significance. One, an Irish case, which uh, uh, Judge uh, Baker has already alluded to, that's the Antashka case, which was decided by the Supreme Court earlier. And another case, which the Court of Justice, not, not a decision of the Court of Justice, but an opinion of the Court of Justice, which the decision uh, is imminent, which I think could be quite significant as well. Um, before I kind of move on to deal with those, I just want to put some things in context. I presume the first thing to say is that in Ireland, um, our uh, system of public participation can be considered relatively open. Uh, in a comparative sense. And what I mean by that is particularly our planning system, which is an open system of third party appeals, doesn't really require you to establish any particular um, prejudice or interest in the development. But that's in contrast with other jurisdictions. For example, I think Colin will tell you it's slightly different in the UK or in Scotland. So basically any person um, can object at first instance, certainly, and make submissions in the development um, uh, and can generally uh, lodge an appeal to on board and all of that if they participate in a fee in relation to it. Uh, so that leads to a scenario or a situation where people who may not live or be in any way impacted by a potential development um, object to it. Uh, and there have been a number of high profile cases where that has occurred. And that is complemented in a sense by a, a relatively liberal approach towards local standard that the Irish courts uh, have taken. Um, in effect, again, you don't really, uh, in judicial review proceedings, it's relatively easy to um, establish an interest um, in, when challenging decisions. Um, it isn't an insurmountable barrier as it would be in other jurisdictions. I mean, some further context, of course, is, is that the drivers of public participation are essentially external. Uh, as already been alluded to, there's the Aarhus Convention, which is an international agreement, um, so it doesn't have direct effect in Irish law having regard to our system of law, um, but that it clearly is of, of great significance, both as a policy instrument, but also as force in domestic Irish law uh, to the mechanism of European Union law, because the convention of, is part of the European legal order and specific elements of the convention have been implemented uh, and transposed into European legislation. Therefore, they make their way into Irish legislation. The most obvious example is the public participation provisions of the EIA directive, and obviously that, that the environmental information and other elements of the convention are, are incorporated into EU law. So in that sense, too, part, uh, uh, because it's part of the EU legal order, it, that becomes the primary conduit through which it is being incorporated into domestic Irish law. And it's proved hugely, hugely influential. There's no question of that. Um, it's very difficult to see to look at any of the major environmental decisions, uh, for example, that were delivered this year, and you would see the, the kind of fingerprints of the Aarhus Convention either directly or to the mechanism of EU law all over. But there are some problems, having put some context in it now. You see, I put a question mark beside the problems because this really, you know, depends on your perspective on things. Uh, one thing you can identify, and it alluded to one of the questions that that uh, have, was put earlier, you know, where people have made the point that there's objections frequently to large infrastructure developments, um, which are delayed, even though they may be environmentally beneficial, uh, like waste waste treatment uh, or water treatment. And you can even make an argument about renewable energy projects, although they're more interesting. Um, and there is this persistent policy strand which seeks to kind of streamline, I use that word, you know, streamline, rationalize, um, improve, depending on your perspective, the decision-making process and usually through some form of limitation of public participation. And we can see that with the strategic infrastructure development mechanism whereby the um, application for large strategic infrastructure development were um, act was amended and they now go directly Board. You see strategic housing development again, um, applications for large scale housing development directly to the board with curtailment of the traditional public participation provisions. And also, more contentiously, in the forestry consent uh, area with the new legislation, uh, which has already alluded to, uh, and quite a lot of controversy around that legislation. 
Uh, and also, as many of you be aware, there are mooted proposals, um, nothing very tangible at the moment, but certainly there has been commentary uh, and various different um, uh, suggestions that there would be review of the legislation in the area of planning to kind of streamline or reduce public participation or impose some form of uh, provisions requiring applicants to establish a particular interest in the position that they're challenging. And again, these tend to respond to quite high profile cases. For example, the Apple case and another high profile case of housing development um, uh, as well, which have been delayed uh, you know, in judicial review proceedings. Now, just to look then at the key provisions, um, obviously the key provisions are the EIA directive, the core obligation to um, deal with or require um, uh, before development consent is given, there's a requirement to conduct an environmental impact assessment in accordance with the requirements of the directive. Um, Article 6 of the EIA then as part of this, and again, this reflects our house obligations, enshrines the right of public participation. Article 6 to the public concern shall be given the opportunity to participate, um, early and effective opportunity in the environmental decision-making process. Key commentary here, when all options are open, and that's when the public participation uh, obligation must be, must be met, must be approved. The convention itself, the Aarhus Convention, although again not directly affected in Irish law, still of significance in relation to it. And again, those provisions many of you will be familiar with. That's kind of one of the core obligations, the requirement to have access to judicial review proceedings um, before a court of law um, uh, established by law to challenge the substantial procedure quality of environmental decisions. Um, so just bear those two key statutory provisions in mind in relation to it. Um, there's also some key key definitions here. There's the concept of development consent, which is key. Um, so it's the decision of the competent authority or authorities which can develop proceed with the project. The public and um, public concerned are defined. Um, uh, which are definitions which are significant as well. So um, that's where we see um, uh, European law imposing into Irish law the public participation requirements. Uh, mainly, uh, it has to be said, to the mechanism of the Environmental Impact Assessment Directive. So some of the issues that have arisen here in relation to this is, is, is the concept of development consent. Uh, critical because um, it triggers the requirement for EIA uh, and it also triggers public participation requirements. So if working is or isn't development consent, it becomes a very important question in that light. Um, it is, uh, and I think it's an important point to know, know and be aware of, um, is it is an EU law concept. Uh, and this has been affirmed recently by the Supreme Court, but it, it, it is important to appreciate that we tend to understandably um, view it a development consent from a domestic perspective. Uh, we say, what is a development consent in domestic terms? And therefore, uh, therefore, if it's a domestic consent, as we perceive it in develop in, in domestic terms, it meets the EU requirement. That's probably the wrong, that is the wrong way to look at it. It's in effect an EU concept. And that was a point I, I think was made by uh, Mr. Disney Rafferty in, in, in his industry in London. So on the Section five mechanism, uh, and she makes the point that you 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 have to look at concepts, particularly concepts in planning law. Um, you have to look at these concepts from the perspective of domestic law, or of European law, not domestic law. In other words, you look at it from the other perspective. And the court itself, the European Court, ha has generally taken a proportional interpretation in regard to the objective of the EIA directive. So. Having kind of set the scene for you, I want to move on to um, um, I want to move on to the decision in Antarctica via Bor Panola and McQuaid Corries, um, which I think has already been very briefly alluded to by um, uh, Miss Justice Baker. Um, so this case dealt with the substituted consent regime, and uh, briefly, the substituted consent regime was brought in after the uh, Court of Justice condemned as country to the requirements of the EI directive, the previous um, retention planning permission scheme. In other words, the uh, fairly notorious mechanism whereby you could build something without planning permission and then retrospectively apply for planning permission. And the difficulty with that is that's incompatible with the EIA directive. Although the court made clear that uh, retrospective uh, development consent was not of necessity 
um, incompatible with the EIA directive, but provided it was an exception, very much the exception to the rule in relation to it, and also provided it didn't operate uh, an any regime making provision for it, didn't operate as a mechanism to circumvent the core obligations of the directive. So Ireland then introduced a, a very complicated system of substitutions to try to address this need, provided a number of different pathways which allowed uh, you to get substitute consent. And it was a separate regime for quarries under substitution. Uh, all very complicated and evolved, which uh, to a certain degree it kind of had to be, because um, it had to make provision for various different scenarios, uh, and all generated quite a significant amount of litigation. Uh, the Antarctica case had its background in one of the particular, what they call gateways to substitute consent under section 177C. Um, and I don't propose to go into the detail of the case um, and the, or the statutory provisions. There were a number of arguments advanced in it, but the core issue was a public participation point, essentially because the scheme, the system had two stages. You had to apply first for leave to apply for substitute consent before you got anyway. Uh, and then there was a second stage in relation to where you made a substantive application. To be clear, you couldn't go to the substantive uh, mechanism uh, until you got leave, but just because you got leave didn't of necessity meant that you got uh, ultimately a grant of substitute, of substitute consent to be refused. Um, th the first stage contained no provision for public consultation. And in fact, um, uh, Antashka wrote into on board Panola when they granted leave in this particular case. And they tried to say, we want to make submissions on this. We don't believe that, in fact, leave to apply should be granted here. And under this particular section 177, there was a requirement to establish uh, exceptionality and exceptional circumstances. That issue was determined at the first stage. And once it was determined at the first stage, it couldn't be determined at the second stage. So Antashka wanted to make submissions about that, uh, but the board refused them. And that was essentially what this element of the case, the public participation element. The question was whether, in fact, that was compatible with the EIA directive or not, whether or not excluding uh, public participation on the first stage um, was compatible with the um, directive. And I mean, the key issues which arose there was, was in fact the application for leave, um, an application for a development center within the meaning of the EIA directive. Um, because just to bear in mind the, the, the respondents' arguments was, if we deal first again, the appellant said the public have a right to participate uh, on in a particular stage because effectively the existence of exceptional circumstances or the circumvention of the directive uh, decision is made is made at, at this preliminary stage. And it occurs once and for all at that stage, and you can't revisit it. So it makes sense that you must have a right to make a point. Because if you didn't, you, you wouldn't be you'd be ex uh, uh, effectively excluded from a critical issue. Uh, the states and the uh, board's approach towards it, well, it was to say, well, look, the application for leave to apply for substitute consent isn't really a, an application for development consent. because Just because you get an application for leave doesn't entitle you to do anything. You may not get substituted consent eventually. So they said in that circumstances, the public participation requirement provisions don't apply. In other words, it's in the nature of free development consent procedure doesn't trigger requirements for public participation under the EIA directive. That only occurs when you make your substantive application. In this case, when you make your substantive application for um, In effect, the court rejected that argument. And they, they, they said, look, when you look at the particular statutory provision here uh, and the particular statutory structure, it is quite clear that in fact these, the application for leave for substituted consent is something more than um, a kind of a, a box ticking exercise, some form of administrative the application procedure, much more substance to it than that. Uh, as the court says, it's a highly significant aspect of the overall process and that the outcome of the leave application will determine whether it's a substantive application. Uh, and and um, the court also emphasized the fact um, that, that decisions were being made at this stage, which were critical decisions, which were significant decisions, and which could not be revisited under the statutory scheme. Um, 
And there's some interesting commentary, again, Mr. Justice McBetton, who delivered the judgment, you know, says the underlying purpose of public participation in environmental matters is to facilitate good and fully informed decision making. And it is to be acknowledged that the public as a whole is one of the greatest repositories of environmental information. And the EIA directive recognises that without the opportunity to participate, it will be more difficult for the competent authority to reach the kind of decisions that's envisaged. And he later goes on to conclude that the end provisions of the Act fail to provide for a, a effective participation at a stage when all solutions remain open. Um, and quite clearly, the option of refusing to grant leave is off the table by the time the public have any opportunity to make submissions which may be of relevance to that decision. So the court really is not buying the argument advanced by the respondents there that this is some type of redevelopment um, 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 administrative process couldn't really trigger um, a public requirement. Um, some other interesting comments in the, in the judgment, um, Judge McCarthy says he, in purpose, the directive has been essentially concerned with affording uh, members of the public with an opportunity of participating in the process at a time and when it is the capacity to influence matters, certainly those critical to the decision. Uh, and he, 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 he reads that into it from the phrase when all options are open. I think that's a particularly uh, significant passage from the judgment. What the court is saying that public participation provisions properly construed under the uh, provisions of the directive uh, means that that public participation must occur uh, when the public have a capacity to influence matters. Certainly those are critical to the decision. It may not be all the matters, but certainly those are critical to the decision. I think that is in a very important passage of the judgment. Um, one point that the court says uh, as well, and I think it's worth bearing in note, is uh, it approves the uh, comments of the Advocate General in a case called Parazan. Uh, and she was talking in a slightly different co context, but simply makes the point that there are limits to the rights of public participation. And uh, there must be, while well, there must be public participation in accordance with the requirements of the directive, it's not endless uh, and it can be curtailed. And the interests in effective and timely administration must be balanced against the rights of the public. So effectively, it's a balancing exercise uh, which occurs there in relation. To that. So what's the significance of the decision? Um, the first point to note is the decision has to be carefully considered because um, it is dealing with a particular statutory uh, provision and a particular statutory scheme. And the court made clear that if the scheme had been slightly different, it, it might it might have uh, survived the challenge in relation, particularly if it had allowed, for example, uh, the exceptionality uh, criterion, which is required to uh, obtain leave, be re-examined at the substantive stage. Then you might have had a different outcome. You've been entitled to participate in that key element of the scheme. Um, uh, now, what the judgment does potentially call into question is other aspects of development consent procedures, especially pre-application procedures in which there's either no or limited rights of public participation. Uh, and there are aspects of that, the, probably the example that comes to light most uh, obviously is the pre-application procedures in the Developing mechanism whereby there are mechanism whereby there's mandatory pre consultation with the board where only the developer and the board engage as to whether, in fact, this application is suitable for the bid process. <coughs> and there's no entitlement to make public submissions in relation to it. And that was challenged unsuccessfully in O'Callaghan. But <clears throat> the question is, is whether there's a requirement for a revisitation of that or a reformulation of that or re examination of that in light of Antarctica. And in fact, there are, as many of you will be aware, uh, a number of decisions and challenges which leave has been granted uh, in those type of challenges, dealing with various aspects of the state and the strategic housing development, where people are challenging the um, public participation, the absence of public participation, and in some cases directly citing. Now, it remains to be seen um, as to where those proceedings will, will ultimately go. But I would expect this time next year we may have a number of judgments of matters are, are re-examined or are re-evaluated. The next case I, I'll briefly refer to is not a case, it's an opinion of the Advocate General in case C826. Um, it's a Dutch case, I'm not going to try and pronounce it. Effectively, what this case involves is an application to um, an application for a permit to the construction of 
large pig farm in Netherlands. And it was challenged by one individual and three NGOs. None of them participated at first instance. So they came into it at the second stage. And Dutch law allows any member of the public who, uh, uh, to take part in public participation procedures, um, challenging the permit, but only interested parties have, have uh, standing to challenge the resulting permit. And on the condition they have taken part in the public so the issue that arose is whether, in fact, um, these individuals were entitled to challenge the permit being granted, circumstances where they hadn't participated prior to this. And that was referred to the court. And um, the court, fairly, there were two questions, effectively. The first question really um, concerned the individual citizen's right to challenge the permit and the extent to which Holland, as a member state, was obliged to provide access to customs. Um, uh, under the Aarhus Convention. And the Advocate General examined the wording of Article 9.2 of the Convention, and she said it is clear, or he said it was clear, that it affords public access to justice uh, to members of the public concern by virtues of having a sufficient interest in maintaining an impairment of a right. And um, he noted that while Article 6.7 of the Convention allows the public at large to submit comments, information, et cetera. Um, that's not the same as the public concerned in relation to it. And the uh, Advocate General was of the view that in, in, in terms of answering the first question, that um, the uh, convention did permit um, national um, countries in question, reserve court access to interested parties only. Um, the second question, was does Article 9 of, uh, of the Convention permit member states to make access to justice for the public concern depending on the applicant having submitted observations in the preceding uh, pu pu public uh, participation procedure? And the short answer to that was no. Uh, and there's three different reasons here in relation to it. Um, I'm not going to go through them, I'll go through them pretty quickly. Effectively, um, she said it's not in the text of the Convention. Uh, and you can't read into it. You referred to the previous uh, um, uh, decisions of the uh, court, and, and that reading into it of that kind of article with that. And he makes the point it would undermine the standing of NGOs, environmental NGOs, if you required them at every single stage, in every case, to make public commitments before they can challenge the permit. And he also made the point that imposing that obligation <coughs> would be to uh, kind of crazy outcomes. So, <clears throat> just quickly look at the conclusion very quickly. Um, that's the Advocate General. The court normally form, fo follows the decision of the Adv Advocate General's opinion. Uh, it remains to be seen whether they will do that. If they if they adopt an approach, and depending on what they say in the judgment, it may mean that attempts to constrain uh, public participation uh, to those who are participating in the initial um, decision-making process may prove difficult under EU law. But it would also clarify, hopefully, that decision uh, beyond that, that prior public participation must not be a condition um, for standing under Article 90 of the Convention. Just to conclude, um, it's a very fluid, evolving situation, um, certainly at EU level. The direction of travel is pretty clear. The direction of travel is towards an expansionary approach of public participation. But there's pretty obviously, it seems to me, a tension between the policy agenda of understandably, and sometimes for very good reasons, uh, trying to streamline the development consent process and facilitating public participation, which meets the requirements of both you and our house. And that um, tension is pretty clearly going to play out in the courts. Uh, in Ireland and in, within the European Union, uh, I think over the next few years. Uh, and what would be significant is that it will be, uh, the key dynamic here will be the EU law and our dynamic arena. Very little coming from the domestic side in terms of public participation. Um, the initiatives are all coming from the EU, the EU law imposing our, the obligations under EU law being imposed into domestic law and the compatibility of domestic law with. So I'm going to conclude on that. 